Hey, Blake T. Wild here, and this isn't my normal angle that I really record stuff from. That is because I am doing a little director's commentary sort of thing for The Custodians, Agents of Cross, giant-sized first issue, number one, a kick at the can. Because at the time of this recording, there are only two issues, two copies of this first issue, left in stock at my Etsy shop, blaketwild.etsy.com, right here. So check that out if you want to get the physical release. Over 60 pages of pure comics. That's what you get here from Wild Comics. Only $15, or a better deal than anything you'd get from Marvel or DC these days, that's for sure. But I also have, at my Etsy shop, all five issues of Destructo Boy are available. It is uh, all five. Uh, individually, they are $10. The first two issues are little two-parters. So maybe you have the Era of Alpha Cardinal and the Eclipse of Google Plex. And the final issue, Grimlax the Astro Knight follows Destructo Boy as he battles Grimlax the Astro Knight. This is our fun for the whole family um, just sci-fi, wacky zaniness. But if you don't want to purchase the physical issues of Destructo Boy, I am serializing the entire series on my Patreon. And not just that, but I'm also doing uh, Marvel and DC Rewind and a new podcast, little uh, audio commentary sort of thing called Pop Pop Popcorn where I watch various movies that I enjoy, and then I talk about them in a side video. Uh, Marvel and DC Rewind is my audio commentary series. I recently did a track for the first Iron Man film from 2008. But that's not all. You also get a little sneak peek uh, behind the scenes sort of stuff of creating the custodians. And you get uh, videos early when available, and I'm also going to be serializing The Custodians, Agents of Cross on there as well. So if you're unable to get the physical version of it, then you can check out my Patreon and see what lies in store there. I will be posting uh, the pages each week, just like I am with Destructo Boy. So I know this probably isn't going to be everybody's cup of tea, um... But I am aware that there are a fair amount of people who do watch my videos that are into actually making comics and having comics of their own and wanting to, you know, continue that. And this is a video for anybody who's unfamiliar with my content. This is a just whole laydown of a comic I created entirely by myself, how I did it, what I did, what services I used, everything like that. And hey, maybe it'll help some people out. Maybe people will find it interesting. Who's to say? But without further ado, let's get right into things with this. This is the initial copy of the Custodians. We're not really the initial copy as much as it is a, as it says on the cover, an ash can preview. Ash cans were um, little this size, about the size of an ash can. Um, they were popular up until about the 90s or so, you would see them often. It's pretty much just a little preview, a little working story of what the comic's gonna be. Sometimes it'll have like concept art, sometimes it'll have just a rundown of the story itself. But this is, uh, I can't remember, the first like 10 or 12 pages of the... Um, the first issue right here that I printed up very hastily last year for uh, a local comic convention, Yumicon, that I was attending, just to have a little a little advertisement for what is to come. Now, uh, you'll probably notice a couple of very minor differences between these two, primarily this character right here. Her name is Kelly. Uh, you'll notice that I completely changed her eyeballs and the color of her coat. Also, the trash bag changed colors. But about, other than that, it's pretty much the same. The squares are a bit different. That is because I uh, completely redid this cover of the actual issue when I actually got around to completing it. Uh, and this, So yeah, like I said, this was just a little promotional bit. I was handing them out for free. And this is... 
the tagline, the log line for the Custodians Agents of Cross. What happens when the only heroes that can save the world are an intelligent baboon, a pyrokinetic teenager, the world's smartest man, and a four-armed werewolf? Find out in this exciting six-issue series from Blake T. Wilde. But this is not where the Custodians started, no, no, no. I mean, technically it did, because this was the first ever printed version of the Custodians. The Custodians started all the way back in about 2015, 2016-ish. Probably 2016, maybe closer to there. And that's how long I've been working on this book. Over and over again, probably about seven to eight different iterations of this char these characters and this story. Well, not even this story. It's changed so much, just over and over again. I've reworked it constantly. Here is the sketchbook that the Custodians originated in, uh, in a way. This is from 2019. These are a couple of uh, villainous characters, such as the Exploding Man, a man wearing a strangely textured suit who could dislocate his jaw and extend it outward and cause explosions within his mouth. So if he bites down on your arm, he'll blow your arm up. Uh, we got Dr. Gorilla Arms, or at this point from February 18th, tw uh, 2019, just Gorilla Arms, who is a villain that you'll see in this first issue. So this is how far back things have been continuing. Uh, the Recorders, who are strange alien camera people. And here is one of the main characters, Charlene Corrigan, as she was known in 2019. A.K.A. Charlie the Werewolf, the four-armed werewolf. Um, that's what she looked like initially. Far more dog-like. You also see how far my art style has come since when I was doing these in 2018, 2019. Uh, this was, again, this is the first ever rough layout of the cover image. So this is when Mitch was still a, uh, still a chimpanzee and not a galata baboon like he is here. Um, pretty much mostly stays the same. Werewolf Charlie is holding a broom or mop or something. Uh, Kelly went from a mop to a trash bag. The Neuronaut, who is the world's smartest man with the power of elasticity only in his right arm, is always been cleaning the logo. And Mitch, of course, has a mop. And there's a very rough little sketch of the Neuronaut. There he is again. So, again, you can see... Let's see, there's there's a little comparison between, like, one of the, probably the first drawing I ever did of him compared to what he ended up looking like. Always been a black guy, always been pretty middle-aged, um, always had this similar jumpsuit aesthetic going on, has always had the elasticity, only in his right arm. Mask Master, who you may or may not see in a uh, coming issue of the Custodians. And here is another villain that is... Uh, appears in this first issue this is gum uh what was it gum girl i think is what i called her here until i realized that mike allred has a character very similarly named to that in the atomics and Mad Men. so i renamed her to malleable margaret uh another idea or actually no this wasn't an idea this was something that i was doing for myself to figure out the height discrepancies between everybody and it's more or less stuck around about that uh, about that same sort of length. Everybody's about the same height as what I initially imagined. Apparently, Charlie the werewolf is about seven and a half feet tall. But here's where things get really interesting because this, everybody, is something I don't know if a lot of independent people just getting started really do. Uh, this is um, just a rough draft. This is not exactly thumbnails, but it's a rough page sketch of what it was going to be. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this, but this was the initial idea that I had for the Custodians and the Ferocious Four Strike Again. So as you can see, there are quite a few pages. We're already on page 13. Um, it begins with this uh, general gets impersonated by a shapeshifter. He sneaks into a secret facility. And then the Ferocious Four who are the villains of this preliminary issue and this issue as well. Completely redone. I don't think it says Ferocious Four at the beginning here. Um, they 
break in and destroy some stuff and steal some things, and the custodians are called in. Here it's the Cross dirigibles over Washington, D.C. Cross, of course, a parody of S.H.I.E.L.D. from Marvel, standing for Crisis Repression Operations and Strategic Surveillance. So they're all introduced. Uh, they're all living at a large uh, manor in Oregon, I believe, and they're all at different locations getting called in. And they get the rundown at their giant C-shaped briefing room. And they're sent out to the middle of the desert where the uh, Ferocious Four are trying to set up a some sort of satellite that is going to help them destroy or conquer the Earth. Get a big flume right here in the Oz. I was always I was always a fan of this, so I it's pretty much in every version as well as this which you'll see in the comic. It's Charlie leaping through malleable Margaret as she, you know, forms around her. Um, so quite a lot going on here, and that's where it ends right here. I'm not sure, about page 20-something, 20 23-ish, 20 24-ish, and that was where it was going to end. And then sort of this is my second go at it where I rework some stuff. Uh, it's pretty much the exact same thing. Shapeshifter, the Mask Master, shows up. Uh, Gorilla Arms, Malleable Margaret, they rock up, blah, blah, blah. Um, some fighting between them. And then this is, even from this point, I was imagining fake advertisements and uh, little um, inset stories. So this is Mr. Authority, my version of a sort of Captain America character fighting a bunch of clones of Hitler. And here's a little layout of some fake advertisements. So as you can see, even back here, at this point, I had the ideas for the fake advertisements all laid out. So you don't have to go into this much detail, and that's really where that ends. Um, obviously, this version of it did not get made. Uh, you don't have to go into that much detail if you don't want to. It's just I... This is really when I feel like the ball started to get rolling on what I wanted to have happened. And this is the avalanche that eventually came from this little snowball right here. Because I also have this to show you. Now this is a very large sketchbook. And inside of it are my initial pages that you just looked at. Penciled very poorly. Not completed at all. I was lettering on the page rather than digitally, which is so much easier. And this was probably my third or fourth time. That's something else completely. This was a <laughs> something else. I'm not even going to go into this. Um, this was I don't even know when this was that I made this. <laughs> this was all quite a while ago, but this did not last long, as you can see again. I stopped. I didn't like it. I wasn't happy with it. Didn't like the art style. This I was very into R. Crumb at the time, so uh, you'll see a lot of like you know little dips and dots and tiny little lines, like Todd McFarlane or somebody. And I just was not happy with how it was coming out, so I stopped, and I didn't work on it again until I wrote this. And I'm not going to show this a lot. I'll probably just bring it up whenever it's ready. But this is, um, before I interrupted myself earlier, this is sort of what I was going into, which uh, about how I'm not sure a lot of people uh, who are just starting out in comics by themselves do this. This, let's see, how many pages is right here? Do, do, do. I'm not going to show you all of this because these are the thumbnails for all six issues. These are everything right here is all six issues of the custodians. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I dated this at all, but as you can see right here, the custodians agents of cross, a kick at the can. Boom, there we go. Custodians, they just across the kick at the can. Opens up the setup, the setup. It's at a, you're not going to be able to really tell this because it's my little thumbnail notes. But everything right here is what I envision in my mind as I was writing it. That's the great part of being a writer and artist is that you don't have to really describe the script 
as much as you need to when you're writing it for someone. So pretty much everything you see on here is going to be the exact same as in the finished product that I made. So right here, the circular uh, sort of panel, that is this page right here, page six. So I, I highly recommend having something like this because this is a great thing to work off of. Um, just notes upon notes. This you'll see coming up. I have a little like zoomed in things, just working things out on the opposite pages, trying to figure out page layouts. You can see how I have every single uh, uh, dialogue balloon is sort of worded in. And I don't even need this anymore. I don't need to have these uh, dialogue bubbles drawn in. I don't draw them in. I never bothered when I was doing that, uh, inking the pages for this because it was just so ingrained in my mind as to where stuff should go and how it should be laid out that I just didn't need it when it came to this point in time and creating the book. But now that we are about 20 minutes into this bad boy, why don't we get into the actual comic itself? I'll, I might go back and show you guys the uh, thumbnails if there's anything interesting in there, but that is, this has been sitting here in this book for a couple years now. This is probably 2021 or so. Let me see. Let me check, because I know that there's a couple of, like, character sketches that I was doing. Yeah, it's almost just over two years later, I have uh, some sketches in here of various characters from about August to September 2021 is when I was doing the Custodian's thumbnails, and I just now came out with the book itself. Um, this one was a rough one to do, because primarily uh, throughout the penciling and inking of it, and pretty much everything else, I was still attending college and taking college classes, college classes, so I didn't have that much free time. Now that I am done, I have issues two and three in the bag, um, and I'm working on four and five and eventually, you know, issue six just to have everything done. It's so much easier when you don't have to worry about college classes. But anyway, here it is. The Custodians Agents of Cross. Giant sized first issue. Kick at the can. Number one, Blake T. Wild. And I have said it once and I'll say it again. This is my love letter to the 60s era of books. Hence the checkerboard pattern which you'll you see in comics such as this Flash issue right here. Um, a lot of older DC books had stuff like that. And it also includes all the fake advertisements, but I'll get to this part at the end. Because as we open up, if you do have this book, this right here, Recommended Record Riot, try saying that five times fast, all of these smash songs with a little address right here to mail your whatever you're mailing in to get these smash songs. I guess it's a record, a vinyl record that has all these on here. I don't know. This isn't a real address. It is, uh, what does it say? Uh, Natch Hit Records, Department 101, P.O. Box 018, Danesburg CMC. Enclosed is uh, $2.98, and then it says something else that I can't read because it's too small for me. And I have a giant fucking tripod right here because this is a very shoddy setup. Anyway, I digress. This right here, you can find when to listen to each of these songs because they're color-coded. In old books, old comics from the 60s and 70s, I believe is probably around when they stopped it, they had these little squares printed up here uh, in the top corners. And I always wondered what that was. I always wondered what the squares were for, such as right here. Uh, to my knowledge, from what I can understand, it was to help the, um, the people who would distribute the books, the retailers. They could know when, you know, when to take a book off the stand based on the color or whatnot. Um, something along those lines, just to help retailers out and to uh, ensure that new product from the comic companies was always in stock and on the shelves rather than just sitting there and collecting dust somewhere in some box. But in the Custodians Agents of Cross, it's to tell you when these songs 
were intended to be listened to. If this was a television show, the book or the episode would start off with Kick Down the Walls by Wrath Child. And uh, continues basically throughout this entire little intro sequence up until we are introduced to our characters. I've always found music to be a very uh, in integral part to it and very interesting thing. I used to always just listen to music while reading books. I don't really do that much anymore since I mostly read comics before bed. And I just don't want to have to deal with, you know, playing, finding right music, blah, 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 and having to read next to it. And then, you know, my wife is right there and she'll get annoyed because I'm blasting music. Um, so I don't really do that much, but I wanted to hopefully try and invigorate someone to go through and listen to these songs. Obviously, the songs are going to be a lot longer than than it takes you to read the events that are happening because this is a very fast paced fast moving comic it has to be when there it's over 60 pages and it has three different stories in it uh, but if you want to check out the official custodian soundtrack you can find it on spotify you can also find it in the link below at my link tree there's a link to the spotify soundtrack i created for issue one which has all these lovely songs on here and of course, I just want to go over the uh, the little fake advertisements. This is something that I have wanted to do, and I was really inspired by the Image series in 1963 to do these. There's just so much stuff going on in all the advertisements that you see on all of these books. Everything was created entirely by myself, from images I sourced or bought or found, um, such as... I'm 11 years old and I make $88 to $93 a week, writes one ex writes one of our excellent young salesmen of America, James Rugg. Boys, girls, cut Santa out of the picture and buy your own gifts. You know, it's uh, the salesman kit for the young salesman of America. You get a big money-making young salesman uh, suit or dress, eight catalogs detailing a bunch of stuff, and just various random crap. All you have to do is just send it to Harmonville LC. Uh, got coins for sale. This guy's want uh, wants to find a girlfriend. Irritated eyelids. Soak your eyeballs for ten minutes every night with Ocu Slick. This person, Roger P. Bush, is selling comic books. Real GI dog tags. This one I think is pretty funny. I was happy with how this one came out. Uh, <laughs> impress your friends by wearing. A metal ID tag on a 24-inch beaded chain, just like the soldiers or sailors who these were stolen off of. Play war. Playing war has never been this much fun. You can now identify your, quote, dead comrades in arms. Stolen valor never felt this good. Fellas 18 plus, you can use these to dodge any draft from now till the earth burns in an ever-expanding sun. Or you can take these bad boys in the bars and pick up some buxom babes who love a boy in uniform. Uniform sold separately. So, you know, it's just stuff like that. It's just non sequitur, sort of just ridiculous comic uh, advertisements that you would see. This one, uh, ideas we pay you. Send us your ideas on any subject. The wilder, the better. Uh... <laughs> Uh, it could make us rich, meaning you'll eventually become rich. We are idea brokers in a house of ideas, and the address is for the Marvel headquarters in New York. <laughs> the Marvel offices. So, getting to the comic. You'll notice that the pages look old, they look weathered, uh, they're off-color. The black is not all black. Uh, that is due to a very simple... Photoshop editing trick. The pages I created on a 10% yellow uh, instead of complete white, and I, I collect old antique books, so I have a collection, and I found a couple of old pages that are just blank, and I scanned those and just superimposed them throughout the book, all at varying angles and degrees, so it doesn't really, uh, you know, loop too much. And the black not being black... Uh, this might be a good place to... I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but you can even see the way I color it is a very specific way that it took me a while to work out to where you can see the color outlines like you would on an old book to where, you know, they, would, they were cutting the color separations and you can see that in old comic books. And I really wanted to emulate that, but I wasn't figuring it out specifically with the black. I could get it with 
the colors to show up on a certain way, but I couldn't get the black until I contacted Jim Rugg from Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, highly recommend you check out his Patreon. He has a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, really helps creators. Uh, just he, he does Q and A questions and everything. But I messaged him and I was like, "You briefly spoke in a video about how you get like this sort of retro vintage style of black, and how do I do that?" And he very graciously explained it in far more detail than he had any right to. Um, and so I followed his advice and I went around and I did it. I It looks fucking great. I really enjoy it. It really makes my art stand out. I do it for everything now. Um, and if you want to know what it is, all you have to do is just find an old comic book that has a lot of black values. I used one of the issues from the uh, Black Panther versus the Klan uh, in the uh, Jungle Action, I believe is what they're called, comic books from Marvel in the 70s. Just find something like that, scan it in directly from the book, and I made just a large format, high quality uh, file, and just essentially stitched together a bunch of pieces of the black sections and then just automatically had Photoshop fill it in for me with that texture just repeating over and over again. And it's, you know, you, you're not going to be able to tell that it's just repeating over and over again, but it, it sure fucking works really well to emulate that old style. But anyway, um, this is the story, the setup. Glenworth Institution for the Supremely Powered Criminals Winslow, Arizona. There is a giant crater in Arizona. I didn't know about this until a couple of years ago um, when I was on a road trip and I grabbed just a little flyer from a gas station. I was like, oh my God, there's a giant crater in Arizona. Let's put a superhuman prison there. Um, and of course, there's a big explosion because it is a breakout by Professor Gorilla Arms, who you'll recognize from my initial story. And this little fella right here named Eclectic Blue, who has the power to control anything blue. So, of course, you know, they go through and scatter, fucking destroy the cross guards, um, trying to free their leader, Nuclear Head, who is encapsed in a some sort of, I don't know, lead-lined black box over his head. You'll see why later. Uh, this is a little thing I learned from Ed Piscor uh, just through watching his videos on, um, what is it, uh, X-Men Grand Design. That was another big breakthrough for me because I was like, holy shit, you don't have to draw comics in like that house style like everybody else draws comics. Your comics, you don't have to draw like Jim Lee or some other default generic sort of artist. You can do whatever you want. And really, I have Cartoonist Kayfabe to thank for just giving me the initiative to do this because between that, between realizing that from what you could do with comics from X-Men Grand Design and reading those to Jim Rugg and Ed Piscor's just behind the scenes, especially Jim Rugg because he's just really into the process of making it and just everything you need to do in a comic book. It's not just art. It's not just the writing. It's the coloring. It's the page layout. It's the design. Everything in here, especially when it's an independent publication like this, you cannot have a shortcoming. You shouldn't have any shortcomings. You need to make sure everything is exactly what you want it to be. You'll notice that this isn't. this doesn't have a glare. That's because there's no gloss on here at all. I don't like glossy paper. Uh, I don't think it would ever work for this, which is why it's all just sort of finish a strange textured matte paper. Uh, but this right here is kind of using white as a color. You'll notice even the word balloons aren't white. And if you get this issue or if you look at the digital uh, images on my Patreon, You'll also see that it has little Ben Day style dots that pixelation, pixelation, quote unquote, <coughs> that you see on older books. Or if you go look at a newspaper and look at any of the pictures up close, you'll see those little dots, the uh, pic, uh, the dots per inch right there, the DPI. 
uh, or Ben Day Dots, as they're more commonly referred to when people talk about comic stuff. That is a thing in here. I just worked as hard as I could to make the colors stand out and pop and just not look like anything else that's being released now. I don't want anything drab. I don't want anything muddied. I want just fun, bright colors for a fun and bright 60s inspired book. Uh, so anyway, uh, Nuclear Head's in prison. Uh, the door starts banging. Guards get ready. Counts down to one. Flips them off. And the door busts open. Open fire! Uh, i big fan of Frank Quitely, so I try to add little sound effects to the scenes as possible so their their uh muzzle flares spell out blam they open fire nothing happens and then the strange blue substance starts appearing and psh, snaps them together into this giant just meat ball of death uh caused by of course eclectic blue who has the power to control the color blue and so everybody is killed eclectic blue and nuclear uh gorilla arms show up and this is the first little instance of um, creating a wider world here within the comics is that I bring up the Infinitum Brood, who we are introduced to in issue three of the Custodians. But here we learn, uh, I'm sorry we ran into complications with the Infinitum Brood in Fosterville. And there's a little asterisk, classic sort of editorial note. Uh, catch up on the crazy clash in Infinitum Brood number 86. So stuff like that I was really into. That is, you know, just, that's just pure Marvel DC Comics. That's also inspired by uh, the 1963 book where it's just fake stuff that they're referencing. And just this the old universe has apparently existed before we even opened the book. That is another thing that I did not mention earlier. Is throughout the iterations, the custodians were at varying ideas. Uh, the Originally, the book was going to follow... Mitch and this guy right here, uh, Jack Loathe, Commander Jack Loathe, Commander of Cross. That was always his name. Obviously, it's Nick Fury, but not. Uh, his name is Jack Loathe. Completely different character. He actually smokes, unlike those Marvel characters. Uh, it was going to be about him and Mitch forming the team of the Custodians, and they were completely different characters. None of them were the same except for Mitch who at that time was a chimpanzee. And then I saw Umbrella Academy and all the other people doing stuff with chimps, and I was like, well, fuck it. I'll make him a baboon. But I decided with this, what really helped me get it going was Thunder Agents, which I've spoken about before. I have a little short video on it. Um, one of my favorite uh, all-time comic book villains is from that. The Iron Maiden. She's like Catwoman crossed with Doctor Doom. She's fucking awesome. Um, that, those stories, while there is an origin, sort of pick up each issue like it's the beginning, but also there's clearly an established canon going on. Uh, so that is what I really decided for this, is that I I don't know if how many people are going to pick this up, I don't know how long it's going to be able to be published. Uh, so I'm just going to get as much as I can in each of these issues for people to read. I'm doing it the Jack Kirby way. So there, each panel, there's just something interesting happening on each page. They're doing something different. There's a different item or like technology or background element or device or character introduced on each page, just as so much going on, I needed to cram into these pages. And I couldn't do that if I had to introduce these characters. So the introduction of the characters after Nuclear Head escapes, which I love how this effect of his head came out. It looks fucking so good in person. Um, that was a lot of playing with elements in the Photoshop and trying to get that to look right. Um, so to do that uh, we cut to washington dc this strange giant version of it of my version of washington where there's giant freeways and they're doing something with the washington monument recreating it or something um we meet uh, agents of cross jack loathe who says the world's made a mess it's time for the custodians to clean it up 
And then bam, we cut to the custodians. Here they are. You don't need anything else but this. Custodians, prepare for action. The ferocious four have broken nuclear head out of Glenworth. Immediately make your way to Hangar 10. Mitch, the monkey, the baboon, he is sitting in his office in his room reading a comic about a character named Helios. Kelly Cade, a.k.a. Igniter. She is in her room. She is clearly a fan of this other superhero character I made called Miss Energy. Made her specifically just to be a background character in this. She has a giant Miss Energy squishmallow sort of uh, plush, a signed poster. Uh, Neuronaut is here meditating on an alien planet, studying holograms while these little winged elephant trunked alien things sort of sniff around him and eat stuff out of the dirt and charlie the werewolf is uh reading a book on how to paint your uh, feelings and is uh, painting her very uh, upset feelings she's a very angry sort of painter but that's it boom boom introduction of the characters this is taken directly from an issue of the thunder agents where we're introduced to a side group called, uh, I can't remember what they're called. There's like a special Thunder Agents task force, um, but it's just, you know, a couple of vertical panels with a brief description of who everybody are as they're walking through a hangar. I just stole that directly from that, in that book. I fucking love that book. Huge inspiration, not just on the art or the storytelling, but on the pay, the layout of the comic itself. Um, the whole idea of having these extra stories in between to sort of add to it to ensure that I'm getting as much out there as possible was directly from Thunder Agents. Uh, but hey, look, a green block. Let's see what song that is. Show a Little Love by Lillian Axe. So again, there you go. That's when you listen to that song. It sort of starts playing as they fly away in their little supercopter, as it's called. What makes it super? Who's to say? <laughs> Uh, so they have a little brief description, discussion. This is actually the last page that was on that little Ash Can book. Um, you can also kind of guess that I did have to go in again on these pages and edit uh, Kelly's eyes. So here's the comparison between just the pure black and white inks. And here is the finished version so you know a couple things have changed not too much it's primarily i redrew her face to look a little more human and i redid her eyes to be just full-on white rather than uh, tiny little white dots because that was i didn't like it and i thought it was just a pain in the ass i guess i'll hold on to that i don't really know why because that was the last page <laughs> that it covers uh, but they fly out to the Valley of Fire, Nevada. The ferocious fours and troposphere floats dangerously and mysteriously above it as Nuclear Head prepares the star, uh, which is uh, it stands for something that I can't remember. Uh, it's right down here, actually, on this page previously. Strategic Targeting Aerial Rover. So it's some sort of evil satellite device that he's concocted that he plans on destroying the world with. Classic arrow uh, transition panel, panel transition thing. I love these things. I know a lot of people don't. They think they're dumb. But arrow panel, arrows in the panel borders are just classic Silver Age books. You know, boom, boom, boom. Read here. The world will soon submit to my rule and you shall be my queen. Oh God, it's exhilarating. And then you follow the little arrow to this iPad thing that Eclectic Blue is holding as he says, oh, it looks like the custodians are on their way. And Nuclear Head, very upset at this revelation, uh, sort of rubs his non-existent temples because he's upset that he has to deal with the custodians on his day of triumph. So they come to the confrontation. They yell at each other. Charlie barks at Margaret for calling her a uh, reject. And they break out into battle. Kill them! And they all go... Uh, Kelly asks, do we have a plan? And Mitch tells them who they're going to fight. Very similar, again, to what we saw at the very beginning in that little sketchbook of there's the satellite, there's the group of villains. Uh, Grill Arms has changed his costume to this sort of luchador-looking thing, I decided. Um, again, very similar to what's going to be happening soon. 
Uh, they fight. Of course, there's the whoosh, which is it's changed from foom to whoosh, and there's no uh, ahs going around it. Kind of disappointing that I didn't put that back in there. And here is Margaret turning into a ring again for Charlie to leap through. And I think that's just about the same joke I wrote all the way back then when I did it the first time in that book uh, or in that initial version, which is, oh, good one. But I don't think the judges will score you very well. I think of the original one, it was something like, oh, good girl. You learned a great trick, blah, blah, blah. And one of my favorite things is uh, Mitch, who is a baboon. I, he doesn't really have much going on for him, aside from the fact that he's just a... <sighs> And Mitch, he's just a baboon. He doesn't really have much going on for him, aside from the fact that he's an intelligent baboon who knows how to fight. So he doesn't have, like, superpowers or anything, but I had to give him something to do to beat Eclectic Blue in an interesting way. So I gave him this big backpack that seems to hold just, it's like a Mary Poppins bag or a bag of holding or something, because he says... Only one way to stop it, the eclectic color blue with the dogmatic color turquoise. And he swings a giant turquoise cross that smashes and shatters the color blue that eclectic blue was handling. And I, I, I love how this panel came out. I just really enjoy everything going on here. I think that that looks really good for Neuronaut. I should point out that Neuronaut is a telepath as well. He can only telepathically link with someone through skin-on-skin -skin contact, and we will learn about that in one of the uh, little side issue or uh, side stories going on, the backup issues. But he uh, takes his uh, big gun here that he's going to seemingly kill Nuclear Head with. He finds Nuclear Head in this crazy sci-fi lab as he's preparing this satellite. But dun-dun-dun, it was a fake-out of some sort. And he has been trapped by Nuclear Head. Concluded in the last issue, or concluded in the last story in this issue, that is almost taken verbatim from what would uh, the Thunder agents would say in their stories. And now we cut to the first backup story called Animal. Uh, this sees Mitch going to the 259th century where he teams up with the Familiar League or something like that. Can't remember what they're called exactly. But they are made up of Lucifer Llama, which people seem to really enjoy as a character. Uh, Cherry the Mega Giraffe. Sirius the Sun Dog, who is based off of my American Bulldog, who looks almost exactly like that. And uh, Enid the Wonder Horse. And Chandler the Sea Cucumber. Little Chandler the Sea Cucumber. Nothing fancy going on there. He's just a sea cucumber that floats around in space. And of course, Mitch the Monkey of Might in his uh, sci-fi spacesuit. Obviously, this is inspired by old Silver Age uh, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen and like Superboy Superman issues where he would team up with the Legion of Superheroes. That's pretty much who these guys are. They're the Legion of Superheroes if the Legion of Superheroes were all various weird animals. Although none of these guys are very weird, except for, I guess, Lucifer Llama, who's just inexplicably either a, a demon llama or a llama possessed by Lucifer. Who's to say? <laughs> it's the 259th century. Anything can happen. Here is something I'm not that happy about, which is uh, I just did not want to draw that fucking uh, dirigible again. So I just copied and pasted it. But it doesn't look that bad now that I'm looking at it. Uh, in this page. I just thought it looked bad when I was putting the page together, but it actually looks fine. Um, I changed the color on it, you know, sort of moved it around a little bit. This is the exact same drawing that we saw uh, right here because it's it's overly complicated. I made this fucking insane dirigible, the giant eyeball and all this stuff going on. So I was just like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. But they show up after a mission where they were fighting a uh, hydrogen bond who, you know, he's like... Uh, He's like Hydro Man or something, and Jack Loth is telling them all to uh, get their reports done. I also forgot to mention when I uh, introduced Jack Loth at the beginning, uh, when I said that he was Nick Fury, you'll notice that, uh, like Nick Fury, he has this weird little eye patch that's sort of sci-fi. My initial idea for Jack Loth was to go even further with the Nick Fury parody, and that meant his name was Jack Loth. He was a white old man who had half of his face skin grafted, which means that you get flat. You basically you get the skin of something and you graft it onto the body like, you know, 
say, another person's, like, a uh, someone who donated their body. You get their skin and graft it onto the body, something like that. Half of his face was going to be a black man, and the other half was going to be a white man. It was going to be, like, stitched together like a skin graft, and he was going to wear a weird eye patch with a monocle on it and everything like that, like the guy from Young Frankenstein. But I was like, maybe that's going a little bit too far and too weird for people, so I'll just make him a relatively normal, cybernetic, uh, curmudgeonly uh, commander of Cross... <laughs> But anyway, uh, we go to... I love just drawing cluttered desks, uh, very inspired by real life. So he has a weird little vinyl player, an hourglass, a um, can of soda, a little Helios uh, bobblehead. You'll find out who Helios is throughout this story and, and eventually in issue six of The Custodians. There's a little reveal right there. And you can't really make it out, but that is uh, issue three of Destructo Boy on his table. Uh, whoosh, the portal opens up and Lucifer Lama and Sirius the Sun Dog appear and they tell him that the familiar union requires his assistance. Mitch tries to tell him to go away because he's busy and he's tired, but they're not handling that. They're not taking it. So he, uh, they all get teleported away by Lucifer Lama's weird satanic magic. And these are all three of the same, um, these are all the same clouds of dust and everything. Uh, I just didn't really want to draw them so i just repeated them and i redrew a little bits here and there in photoshop so that's what you need to do this page on the actual this panel on the actual page it's pretty much just that chair and like this cloud um cut corners where you can it'll cost it won't cost you time and you know just make sure it looks good and try to, if you're going to do that, then make some big letters that sort of go over that to where you can't really tell that it's the same thing. And they are cut to one of my favorite pages of this book, uh, Europa, one of uh, Jupiter's moons in the 259th century. Just weird spaceships zooming by. Like I was saying earlier, I'm just super inspired by Jack Kirby and what he does in just every page of Jack Kirby's comics, nearly every panel is just introducing something new, something crazy to look at. So I was like, fuck it, let's... There's giant Jupiter in the back, which is taken from an actual NASA image that I got, and I just recolored it and, you know, edited it and added it in there as just a weird sort of collage element. Uh, we get... We see the Hall of the Familiar Union, where there's just these giant golden statues of all these famous animal heroes... Uh, and then we go to, I can't remember what this is, this was going to say something in English, but I was like, that doesn't make sense, it's the 259th century, let's make it some weird language, um, so this is just where all the animals meet, there's a giant sort of uh, crocodile alligator thing, there's a rhino, this weird little insect stuff, uh, an emu or ostrich with robot arms, and so this is where we learn what is happening. And I love this panel of Sirius right here, just being a silly little dog while he's telling Chandler the Sea Cucumber that they're not going to fail to fight the Light Slugs. The Light Slugs come from uh, one time, I believe I was a little high and I was riding in a car and I was like, wow, semi-trucks look like giant light slugs. They're like giant slugs with lights running around. And I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. I'm going to write that down in my notes. Any notes you have, something I would do and that I am, uh, utilized a lot in this is I had these, like, Walmart sells these tiny little sketchbook notebook things that you can get. And every night before bed, I would just write down whatever came to mind. It's just absolute gibberish. You look like a fucking insane person if anybody finds them. Uh, but there's just so many just strange words and ideas that come to you at that point where you're just about to go to bed and just whatever comes to mind, just don't think about it. Just write until like a couple pages are filled, however much you want to do it. And then just set it away and come back to it a long time, uh, quite a while later, which is what I did. And, you know, uh, f pick out the stuff that sounds cool. Essentially there's, uh, I did that in issue. I did that in pretty much all the issues. There's something, there's at least one or two things from in each of these issues that comes into that. One of those things in this issue is the flannel leper. This is the flannel leper. Obviously not what he normally looks like based on their reactions. Uh, because he was sent to... Uh, what is it called? Um, 
15 minutes ago, the planet was besieged by the Orion light slugs of Baskor 5. Mitch says, I thought we sent them into the void dimension, or the void dimension. Void dimension, there you go. When we defeated the flannel leper. So the flannel leper and these giant light slugs have been in this alternate dimension called the void dimension. Uh, and he has somehow combined himself like Dune uh, to become one of these slugs. Just a grotesque leper appearance on a giant s s space slug. Uh, so they fly to this big academy that's being attacked and evacuated. And they go into battle. Uh, Flannel Leper. I love how this panel came out. I was really happy. I wasn't sure it was going to work well just because, you know, it's not even his whole face or anything. But I think it works really well just to show how gross and off-putting he is. Um, Mitch is trying to get used to his super suit. Everybody's fighting everything. They're killing the light slugs. They're battling fight happens you'll notice that there's not a lot of fighting i i don't care for comics that just it's non-stop action and stuff like that so when my battles and fight scenes happen they don't really last that long it's mostly just it's a situational sort of uh books and everything that's happening but um everybody goes to fight the light slugs except for lucifer llama who stays behind at this space academy uh preparing for it to be cleared out and uh, he telepathically links to Sirius, who he lets him know that it's been cleared. Sirius says that the light slugs are too strong. They're being controlled by the flannel leper. Um, and that he needs Lucifer needs to use their magic, use his magic on the attackers. But it could kill them. And um, uh, Sirius replies that heroes make sacrifices. And Lucifer Lama has this satanic llama cries and tells Sirius the Sung Dog that he will always love him. Chandler shouts telepathically, WAIT! Uh, <laughs> I can stop this! As a sea cucumber, my holothurin tubules can encapsulate the light slugs! Then what? Then what do we do? Can't exactly lock him up again! No, I just need to grow, and Chandler the Light Slug grow or the Light Slug, Chandler the Sea Cucumber grows to giant size. Everybody's shocked. Well, Mitch is shocked. Uh, he asks, can he always, was he always able to do that? Uh, Enid sh tells Chandler that this wasn't the plan and to stop, and Chandler shouts, heroes make sacrifices. Um, again, we get my favorite arrow gimmick. Where it goes, this is impossible! Concentrate on the sea cucumber! And all the light slugs attack, but it's no use. His tubules shoot out, and this is actually how sea cucumbers fend for themselves and everything. Is that the, oh look, you jerk off a sea cucumber. It's actually a defense mechanism that it uses then to ensnare the light slugs and the flannel leper slug within him. Uh, he, Flannel Leper goes, You can never stop me, Familiar Union. You just can't. You can't stop me at all. Um, and was that the right page? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, oh yeah, here it is. I was wondering where this was. Uh, purple, right here. That coincides with Animal by Def Leopard. Uh, so they're going, they're going, they're going. And they fight some bits. And eventually... Uh, Sirius yells out Chandler he realizes what's happening uh, he's Chandler the sea cucumber is taking the flannel leopard into a prison that he can never escape from the sun and he says come back from this as they're all bursting into flames I really I love how this panel came out both in drawing and the color uh, just such a bright these two panels right here just so fucking bright just using white as a color like I mentioned earlier uh, there's just so much just it, hurt, it almost hurts to look at uh but yeah it ends with them just solemnly floating in space after watching chandler sacrifice itself himself i guess uh and he gets a giant statue in that hall that we saw earlier mitch and sirius walk away sirius tries to get mitch to come with him to the 259th century where he's more at home and like you know you can be a hero too but he tells him that he mitch tells him he's not a hero he's just the guy that cleans up the messes that no one else wants to and he's reported, or he's returned back to the future, or back to the present, and the end. Now we cut to the world's smartest man on the world's strangest adventure. This is another reference to 
the um, the Thunder Agents. There you go. So this is also a heavily referenced uh, scene from uh, The Flash, the first appearance of Barry Allen as The Flash. Uh, in Lieber City at the Bixby Research Facility, uh, the man who will become the Neuronaut sort of sits around. He's drinking his giant milk carton, which is taken directly from The Flash's first appearance. Uh, his co his fellow researchers leave. There's a lightning storm. Oh, very similar to the Flash. Uh, but there's this weird spaceship that <laughs> flies at the page, flies at the reader. And as he's looking at every chemical known to science, I can't believe we used to store them on a simple shelf. There's a giant crash that lets out, but no explosion. Huh, what was that? Must have been those street racing hooligans again. Hope they're okay. So he leaves, he says goodbye to the security guard, he passes this large billboard uh, for Howie Holiday's campaign, asking you to vote for this young teenage man, when he starts to hear a little voice. Who's there? Blah, blah, blah. He's looking around, and he finds this little guy. This is also an idea that I just randomly had. I was walking my dog one night, and I was like, what if I just looked down into the gutter and I saw like a little five-inch tall person laying there? What would I do? So I wrote that down in my phone. My phone is just filled with notes and possible ideas for comics, for stories, for custodians, issues that I'm still working on, stuff I can add to it or change. And so this uh, strange little man is speaking a weird language, and um, eventually he starts speaking English. Uh, Neuronaut picks him up, we get a look at him, and he passes out. And so he takes him back, but unaware that he's being watched by these strange people. These strange three men who all look the exact same, who are called Veloc 1 through or, well, I guess Veloc, Veloc 2, and Veloc 3, as they refer to themselves. Um, Once we discover Zekanel's ship, the secrets of the Fractal Kingdom shall be mine. So Neuronaut returns to his lab. He's asking if the little guy's okay. And he, whoosh, he falls unconscious. Continued after the falling page. That's another little note you'd see uh, when advertisements would show up. Hear this, loyal readers, uh, stand tall. We're releasing a deluge of whiz writers and adroit artists. Stay vigilant and choose the most versatile and valuable comics mag around. All of these comic covers that you see, all of these characters, were created entirely for this. With the exception of, like, Silent X, who I already had an idea for years ago. Um, Helios, we see two of his comic covers right here. Uh, Kleptocon's Revenge, Purloin Peru... And uh, the Helios uh, summer, like, back-to-school special or something along those lines. Uh, Miss Energy, Mr. Authority, and Valiant, his little female sidekick. And the Platoon of Patriots. Fang, the Lascar, who's sort of a Namor uh, Aquaman character. Dyson, a woman of futurity. She's a fu woman of the future with a Dyson Sphere for a head. A Dyson Sphere is a proposed uh, device to... In cap enclose the sun to provide limitless power essentially it's the giant rings that go go around it so i guess her head is a sun uh cosmic constable that should go without saying who that is inspired by alabaster ashcroft sort of a doctor strange um constantine character golden silk uh that is a character that you can see in my first ever release comic destructo boy and other exciting stories or other exciting tales rather um, she's like a spider woman kind of character. So I, she's not, she wasn't in, created specifically for this. Neither was Dyson. Now that I think about it, I came up with them years ago. Uh, the Sentinels of the Earth, Justice League or Avengers sort of story. They're back battling Herculosis, which you can't see on here. Uh, Villainous Vacillations, sort of a classic. Oh my God, the bad guys are good and the good guys are bad now sort of story. Infinitum Brood, we get a little teaser for the Infinitum Brood here. And one of my favorites, Silent X. Maybe I'll go over these sometime. Uh, these were all created on giant 11 by 17 size pieces of paper, just like the actual comic itself. So here is, uh, let's see, so here is the Sentinels of the Earth, number whatever, uh, Assault on Herculosis. Here is the actual illustration. So we have all the characters uh, portrayed here. Um, 
so you can see the size that it started as and what it became and i did this size for all the covers that you see so that gives you a bit of an idea moving on we're done with the advertisements neuronaut appears in a strange dickoian world um within the mind itself uh we learn his name actually i think we we learned it earlier it's, it's a hamilton harlan harry for short to some uh, but zek nl appears and he explains you know uh he you are in or neuronaut is in zek nl's mind that's why it looks so strange and he sort of tones it down for him since zek nl is an uh, extra dimensional being um, so it becomes sort of, uh, just brain synapses and, uh, whatnot sort of tethered here and there. And he's like, you can do anything here. Look, you can fly like me. And, whoa, this is incredible. He flies away. He's super happy. And they're flying through Zekanel's memories, such as when his ship crashed, how it passed, uh, Neuronaut, and he was captured in the shockwave. Uh, you must have been close to the location of my downed ship. It functions on mental fortitude and positive thinking. When it crashed, it sent out a shockwave, and you were in the blast radius. The expelled Alpha, Theta, and Delta waves have gifted you the power of telepathy. Congratulations. We get another one of my favorite arrow <laughs> transitions. Um, this is incredible. So I can read anyone's thoughts? Correct. As long as you make skin-to-skin -skin contact. Skin-to-skin -skin, skin contact? Why is that? An evolutionary adaptation my species made to encourage and enhance reproduction. Fascinating! So they, you know, they fly through this astral mind space. Uh, he learns what's going on. Um, then he... <laughs> Zek and L, if you haven't realized it or if you haven't picked up on it based on the strange outfit. Uh, he's he's a Superman parody. Uh, Zek and L, Cal L. And uh, Velox are pretty much just Jorah, or not Jorah, uh, uh, General Zod, or just whatever other evil Kryptonian there are. But this version, he's a tiny little five-inch man from another reality. And that's even more given away by when he explains to Neuronaut that he is currently in a healing concussion, but he'll soon be back up to snuff. Uh, so they both wake up, come back to reality. And he explains that Neuronaut must help him find Methuselah, his ship, his crashed ship. But he'll have to get down to his size. And so he sends him this little black ball that Neuronaut ingests and he shrinks down. One of my favorite little uh, effects old comics would use where it's pretty much just the same image, just shrunken down. And they go to the floor and start looking around. Um, Zekanel starts flying around. And then they notice that the Velox are on their way. They're also looking for the ship. They demand to know where it is. And uh, they are not about to tell them. So uh, he tells Neuronaut to begin searching for it. Uh, we get a strange little Silver Age Superman would, also, would often go like, Great Rao! Or something along those lines. Spout off a, a Kryptonian god or deity. So Zekanel does the same by Igus Chute. Or whatever, however you want to pronounce this strange word. Um, I will not let you reach it. And Neuronaut begins, Come on, come on, think! How do you open your third eye? Sounds like a terrible test question. That's it! It's just an equation that needs to be solved. So, of course, as everyone knows, open-mindedness equal equals total... Fuck. <laughs> open-mindedness equals total perception of the universe divided by the uh, square root of psychonautical discoveries multiplied by neurons and multiplied by total synapses divided by meditation divided by gnosis plus thoscroll divided by um, the inverse of collective thought equals third eye. And that happens. He is taken out into the only page of this book that it has bright white on it for some reason he sees the past in almost a comic panel format like we would uh he floats through he's like my god i've opened my third eye and i'm shifting reality by accessing my memory and he discovers that zek and L's ship crash landed in his carton of milk and here are some more advertisements grow your own monsters from home uh, order now and get deluxe accessory kits with Divining Rod, Dictionary of Words of Power and Mantras, and a manual on how to cast a circle of safety. 
uh, bicycle windshield, a surprise package, joy buzzer, a trick gun. It fires cockeyed. It curves. It breaks apart mid-flight. It's impossible to shoot. It's sure to set all the kids on the block running. There's a barrel of fun in every shot of this amazing trick gun. X-ray spectacles, because you got to have something to advertise in X-ray specs. Slip on this pair of conspicuous X-ray specs, and you won't believe your eyes. Based on stolen technology from the French, these glasses allow you to see the bones of your hands through walls, into the minds of artists, through the veil, and into the void. Crazy! And, of course, if you wanted any of these fine packages or items, just mail the Ennis Distributing Department, GL21, Box 29, Elbridge, California, and uh, list whatever items you want. And of course, if you are not 100% delighted, you may return part of your purchase after 100 days free trial for a full refund. Uh, so we cut back to the story, getting back into things. They're fighting and whatnot. Uh, it, the... Zekinel gets the upper hand of the Velox and flies away, picks up Neuronaut, and they land at the milk carton. He dives in. The Velox appear and blast Neuronaut with a radiation or some sort of energy in his right arm. That's how he gets his elasticity, is because he was shot by some sort of ray from the Velox. And they are unaware that... Uh, uh, what's his name? Zekinel's ship has exploded out of the side of the milk carton, still covered in milk, and shoots them into the void dimension. Uh, there you go. Pretty much it's the Atom Zone. Or Phantom Dimension, that's what it's called. I mean, it's the Phantom Dimension, but it's called the Void Dimension. The Void Dimension. Uh, so he sends all the Velox there as they say he will rue the day. And we get a little calming ending. Uh, they say their goodbyes, and there's a very brief reveal. They say goodbye. He'll have to wait an hour until he returns to his normal size. Think of it as time granted to learn your new abilities. I must return to my world until we meet again. And then under his breath as he floats back up into his ship. Father. Dun, dun, dun. What does that mean? Who knows? Maybe we'll find out. An hour later, Neuronaut wakes up, or he gets bigger again. He's returned to his normal size, and he goes to open the door, and oh my god! The blast he took from Velox's beam! It must have granted him strange power! But only in his right arm. <laughs> but he is not the only one who was granted strange powers. Dun, dun, dun. The end, question mark. And we get another ad. Who is Dyson? Dinah Denson was once the most acclaimed engineer and physicist of the 23rd century. After her solar energy converter was sabotaged, her molecular structure was altered, and she was flung back through time. Time, time. Dyson, on sale everywhere. And here we are, back with the custodians in the present. All of the little side issue, backup issue stories, they're all happening in the past. These are just previous adventures that the Custodians went on, previous issues of this comic series that we were not able to see. But I provided you little sort of 10 to 15 page glances at what is and what was in their history. Uh, here really exemplifies using white as a color uh, with Kelly's hair. Something about just... Uh, having her she's always had this just pure white hair color i always thought that was just would just be a really interesting standout appearance but even more so after i you know started using white as the color and having this textured off white uh, yellowed page but they're at the mercy of the ferocious four and you know you see his hands sort of slinking up there so they're fighting um uh Mitch gets tossed around by Eclectic Blue. He says, okay, Blue Balls, you decided the hard way. What affects Blue worse than Turquoise? Ah, fuck me. The Violent Violet. So Mitch comes after him with some Violet uh, boxing gloves. Um, Kelly is overlooking the charred husk of Gorilla Arms as he starts to crack and, like, break apart. And she's like, oh, what the fuck? That's gross. What is wrong with you? And he appears in his underwear because he replaced his DNA strands of gorilla DNA with the Australian tiger snake, meaning he can now 
<laughs> essentially repair himself and form a new, uh, which for some reason he always comes out wearing tidy white underwear. <laughs> Prepare to meet the dangers of the animal kingdom, he says as he tosses her around like a rag doll. Um, they face off again, uh, Charlie and Malleable Margaret. Mitch is chasing down Eclectic Blue. He punches him, and I just thought this would be a fun gag, which is, um, I kind of covered it with the uh, word balloon, but it says, poofed. Uh, Eclectic Blue, once he gets struck by this, uh, th the punching glove, he sort of bursts open like those blue exploding die packs that they put in pieces like money rolls and everything for people who try to rob banks. So it gets all over Mitch. Um, Kelly has enough of this. So she just starts blasting her fire at grill arms, melting the floor beneath him, sending him to his seemingly demise. She flips him off, calls him a jackass. Margaret gets pissed that her goons have been thwarted. And so she just goes, I've had enough. You know, people really underestimate the damage I can do. And she encapsulates all of their heads within her malleable form. Um, on average, it takes a human seven minutes to die from lack of oxygen. Let's see if we can break a couple world records. And so back with uh, Neuronaut and... <clears throat> Nuclear head, he's gloating. Neuronaut's able to sneak his hand up and touch one of the atoms inside. And we shoot into the mind space once more for Scott Stone. Here is what he used to look like as a human. Uh, he goes, you were in your sad little hate-filled mind, Scott. The brain space, the mind sphere, highway of inner thoughts. And... Um, this is also something I didn't take this from Get Out. I took this from a personal experience of getting cataclysmically high and seeing the world not through just my own eyes, but through my brain watching it through my eye holes. This is what it feels like if you get a bit too high on some marijuana, kids. So don't do it. It, it really freaks you out, especially if you have to go to the store. <laughs> but he's floating through this blank space. Um, watching himself hold Neuronaut. Cut back. Uh, Mitch knocks to Kelly in Morse code to bake Margaret like clay. She does so. Flames just enrapture her totally, and she is destroyed. And Charlie breaks out. Kelly breaks out. Mitch has a bit tough of a time because he's just a monkey, so Charlie has to come over and punch it for him. And then Kelly asks, uh, does the ship feel like it's getting, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, falling? Um, cut back. Uh, uh, <laughs> Neuronaut makes Nuclear Head put uh, him back on the ground. Turn away from the controls and pick up my Neutronic Launcher. This is what we have established earlier in the story. It has a special kind of bullet or grenade inside of it. And Scott Stone, Nuclear Head, is like, what, are you going to make me watch me kill myself? And so he puts it up, the gun up to Nuclear Head's head. And he pulls the trigger. And what should happen? But he is atoms and entire atomic structure is rewritten because the neutronic launcher was loaded with two neutrons, a proton and electron, meaning that nuclear head is now helium head. Uh, he is also now very dizzy and just wobbly as a person. So he's tripping around and he's like, you've ruined me yet again. Uh, and... Right at that moment, the entroposphere begins to crash because not only was Nuclear Head a nuclear-headed giant man, uh, his ship was powered by his hydrogen energy, which is uh, causing it now to crash because he is full of helium. The other custodians show up. Neuronaut pleads with uh, Nuclear Head, now Helium Head, to come with them. But he says, no, what chance I had at rehabilitation died when Sir Scott Stone became Adam Head. So, you know, something has happened. He originally was Adam Head, then he became Nuclear Head, and now he is now Helium Head. They all run away. He clambers his way to the controls, trying to launch the satellite to destroy the world. They're running, cutting back just a few more moments. Yes, yes, I'm going to do it if I can't control the world i'll bring it to the end the helicopter flies away as the entroposphere 
crashes into a fiery explosion. And this in person just... I feel like I need sunglasses to look at this page and just how bright this explosion comes off of on the page. It is insane. It is perfect. Follow the Custodians. Continued adventures in the next action-packed issue of the Custodians Agents of Cross. And here is a little reveal. In an epilogue, we go to Universe 1191934. A Flatland Universe where the Flatland versions of Jack Loth and the Custodians are meeting up to discuss something called the Whiteout and how they're unable to stop it. And they all come together for a big group hug and say their goodbyes as they are wiped from existence. In Universe 101... We need a flaw back! Super's going in, but they ain't coming back! We should just, just give up. We'll get through this! We always do. So here's all the, this is the baby verse, sort of Scotty Young inspired uh, alternate reality in the multiverse of all these heroes and characters that we've seen through various ads and setups elsewhere. Uh, Helios flies in, little baby Helios, or Helios as they pronounce it. Stand back, everyone. I'll take, I'll hold back this white out. Wait, Helios, no. And then the white out, of course consumes them and there's a mysterious voice that comes from off panel we were too late to save the baby verse zephyr take us to another universe we need to hurry the end of issue one and we get some more ads twice terrific two great hits on sale now we get a little better look at both the silent x and infinitum brood some more advertisements, uh, Alabaster Ashcroft, Silent X again. And the final bits of advertisements such as the Well of Creative Fun, Silverfish Farm, own a tank full of happiness, instant pets. Just add a cinder block, hide it in a dark closet, and the eggs hatch instantly right before your eyes. Always clowning around, these frolicsome pets crawl, climb, stunt, and even do the peppermint twist. Uh, atomic Brain Bomb, more x-ray specs, a super dog whistle, surprise package, a zodiac ring, a uh, way to throw your voice, and, you know, just just classic sort of stuff that you would see. Uh, another one of the uh, bodybuilding advertisements. Uh, t Trail of Creative Corp, Ham Shiver, New Jersey. And we finally reach the end of the book, everybody, to Will Wonder's Vigor Vital Flex Method. Boys, men, my secret new Vigor Vital Flex method. You can build yourself a magnificent man muscle magnified body in just six and a half minutes. That's the same length of time it takes to make stove top popcorn. Which do you think the ladies prefer? Are you weak, always tired, lack prep? Give me six and a half minutes a day, that's all. After Vigor Vital Flex, you'll strip down to your skivvies and, for the first time in your life, be proud of your manly build. Yes, amigo, say adios to your weak, flabby frame and get ready for adventure, romance, and all the joys of having a magnificent He-Man physique. Uh, if you said... Uh, or, uh, if you said yes to any or all of these questions, then this is the course for you. I will peel off that fat and give you a lean, virile, vigor vital flex body, equipped with muscles seen only on Hercules himself. You will be bursting with dynamic, manly strength. No starvation diet, no fatiguing calisthenics, no expensive health foods, no weights, no barbells, no exercise at all. All you have to do is just enclose uh, money right here, only 198 and uh, check off what you want and mail it out to Will Wonder System, Porton, Oregon. <laughs> mail money, savings, no risk, free trial coupon. So, you know, you just cut that out of your book and mail it off to Oregon. And there we go. I hope you enjoyed this little, I guess it's a read through, also a little commentary on what I was thinking, what I was going through creating this. Like I said, it's what, six, seven years in the making to get to this point? and everybody digs it that has read it so definitely check it out like i said if you're able to get the physical copies of this first print run definitely do that um if not you'll be able to follow along on my uh patreon that's right here 
Uh, that'll get you uh, all my Destructoboy issues. It'll get you extra videos. It'll get you early access to stuff. Um, it'll get you this. And uh, so how did I print this? Where did I get this done? How did I do this? Thankfully, I was uh, studying graphic design in college. So, you know, my experience with Destructoboy and everything else and everything I learned really helped me out when preparing this and getting it all ready. There were still some issues here and there regarding... Um, just the page layout, I mistakenly, you know, this was a mistake right here. I did not mean for that to look that way. It was just an oversight I was making very early on. Uh, this first issue, like I said, it, it, I was doing it while I was still taking classes. So this whole issue took me probably about a year and a half to do completely. You'll notice right down here, the signature is for, uh, 2022. And let's see what the signature is at the last section. 2023, right here at the mercy of the ferocious four at the very end. Uh, so uh, 2023 as well, yeah, right there. So it's taken. It took me about a year, year and a half to get this completed. So if it's taking you a while to get your work done to do what you want to do, just don't give up. Just keep going. If you don't think it's working, just put it aside. Think of something else. Take a break. Look at what I did. I showed you at the beginning of this video all the stuff that I did before even getting to this point. Before even getting to the point of doing the thumbnails. I had like five different versions of these characters. I have several large folders just full of notes and like scripts of issues. Just so much went into getting to this point where I think it is the perfect encapsulation of these characters and the perfect just story that I can tell with them. I don't think it's going to progress past this. I know it's not because I am very happy with these six issues that are going to be coming out. Uh, I got this printed up through a company called Mixum, the smart way to print. And this is a little free thing that they send out. Uh, they send out uh, just, you know, um, little examples of what they do. So, you know, little books like this. Here's their comic uh, uh, example. It's a little comic that they, they print anything and everything. I get all my posters through them. I get all my books through them now. They show you sizes available. You can also do custom sizes, which is what Destructo Boy is. I highly recommend using Mixum. They are a great company, but, you know, there's so much... So many options that you can use to get your own stuff set up. You don't even have to do it printed if you don't want to. You can just go straight away to digital. You can do webtoons. You can do... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm unfamiliar with what other options there are. I was about to say Comixology, but that's probably not very popular anymore. Uh, you can do Amazon. Amazon does both digital and print-on-demand stuff. You can set up through there. You can go through Etsy. You can... You can just upload digital files to Etsy if you wanted to do it that route. Um, there's so many options if you want to create comics. And just don't let anything stop you. I I didn't. Look at this. Uh, this is... Does this look like somebody who stopped because they weren't sure what to do? There's so many times where I was just like, is this, is this going to be liked? Are people going to enjoy this story? And at the end of the day... I just had to say, maybe, but I love this story. This story is almost 10 years of my life at this point. Um, I started it when I was in high school. I have now graduated with, with a bachelor's from uh, university, and I'm married. And I just now got the first issue out. So... You can do this if you want to make books, if you want to make comics, if you don't think you can do the art, that's okay. There's a comic called XKCD, something like that. It's just stick figures. Um, if you, you can find, if you have friends who can draw, just team up with one another and just make some short story here and there. Don't do 60 pages. Don't do 160 pages. Do like 10 or 15. If that, do one page just sort of quick one and done six panel stories 
like this, like boom, 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 boom. See if you can tell a story like that. It's really hard, but you you can probably do it. Just keep writing. Just remember, I, I should have printed out the scripts for this one as well. Uh, but you can find comic author scripts online. There's plenty of resources at, just to get an idea if you need to. With me, since I'm both the artist and the writer, I did everything in here. You know, I did the color. I did the uh, page layout. I did the design. I designed every single fake ad. Everything you see in here was created entirely by myself, made entirely by myself. Everything but the printing I did. But even then, I had to get it ready for print, which makes them... It's just such an easy and uh, navigatable service. I, I just love it. Um, I forgot where I was going. I lost my train of thought. But you can you can do this, is what I'm saying. If I can do it, then so can you. But I hope you guys enjoyed this very long uh, look through and sort of discussion on where I'm at currently in my comic creating endeavors if you enjoyed it let me know check out my patreon check out my etsy shop and i will see you next time for the custodians agents of cross issue two bye